all the other ones, and we say, my wife and I were happy for 20 years, and then we met. This is chat GPT's collection of the internet wisdom on marriage. You know, uh, and popular culture is always trying to define and redefine and tell us what marriage is all about. So one of the most popular uh, DC Comics character is Wonder Woman. There have been movies that have been made about it. It's very popular. And uh, I was doing some research on this to see who created this character of Wonder Woman. So Wonder Woman is a superheroine character. It was uh, created by American psychologist and writer William Milton Marshall, known as Charles Milton. So Charles Milton was also the guy who invented the polygraph. You know, and how he invented the polygraph was he was the creator of uh, systolic blood pressure measuring apparatus, which was crucial to development of the polygraph, so that this monitors your blood pressure, and it will pick little slight differences so if you lie, your pressure varies, and all of that. So Marston's experience with polygraphs convinced him that women were more honest than men in certain situations, and therefore could work more efficiently. But um, since he was already famous with the polygraph, and, and he came to this observation, it struck, he struck upon an idea for a new kind of a superhero. This was during really World War Time to 1940s. Uh, someone who would triumph, not with fist or firepower, because the world was devastated with all the wars, but someone who would triumph with love. So he shared this idea with his wife, Elizabeth, who is also a psychologist, and so Elizabeth said, well then, make the superhero a woman. So Marston developed Wonder Woman, whom he believed to be a model of that era's unconventional, liberated woman. And, and he uh, designed this Wonder Woman to be an allegory for the ideal love leader, the kind of woman who he believed should run society. Frankly, he said, Wonder, Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for the new type of woman who I believe, listen to me, should rule the world. That was a spark in the birth of the modern feminist community. And this psychologist couple he did not believe in the sanctity or the morality of married beauty. Now this is, on one side, has morphed and dropped and rebirthed into several iterations that keep defining and telling women who they should be on. But who doesn't want to be a wonder woman after all, isn't it? But if we turn to the Bible, we see that God instituted marriage as an institution. The Bible begins with marriage in Genesis and ends with marriage in Revelation. It begins with the marriage that God created between a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. It ends with the marriage between Christ and his bride, but you and me in the new heaven and the new Testament. So if you want to define what marriage is, and the reason why God instituted marriage was he wanted marriages to thrive. So what would be a definition of a thriving marriage? You know, thriving marriages are not about happy marriages. Thriving marriages are bigger than each one in the marriage. Thriving marriages are those which have a purpose bigger than each one of them. And thriving marriages, the way God designed it, are to be a conduit to God's blessings to the world. Thriving marriages are not about happy marriages, but happiness comes as a byproduct of thriving marriages built on the foundation and wisdom on what God has given you. Now, if we turn to our passage in First Peter, uh, the verses that were read to us, 
There is a little bit of background that will go to help out why Peter is writing these things. But the whole thing is writing these things. And what is the cultural background in which people are living as to the this? In fact, this section doesn't begin in chapter 3, but begins in chapter 2, verse 3, which is a summary, and we start unpacking that in different situations. So have your Bibles, turn to the first Peter, chapter 3, verse 3, and we'll keep coming back to this again, where Peter says, Put your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as human beings, they will see your good things and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Peter is writing to brand new Christians who are living in a greco ruling world society. And in a greco ruling world, there was an idol that was Because the, in that world, especially the Romans, they believed prosperity and well-being are important not just to the home, but to the city. They were very quick to find out if the home has a problem, it's immediately going to affect and spill into the city. The Greek philosophy laid the foundation for what was believed and how everyone has to live. But the Roman ordeal was about not disrupting the social order, particularly by anyone who would challenge um, the emperor. And that's why they were upset with Jesus. That's why they were upset with early disciples who were always perceived to be a threat. And so that's the cultural climate in which people who are coming to know Jesus, sometimes in a, in a couple, there was a wife who was becoming a Christian and the husband is not, and, and then sometimes they both were Christians, but nobody else in their surrounding were. So Peter wants to share some words of wisdom in this climate to each church families, how the household is viewed in God's eyes. This is how the greco Roman world views the house. But this is how he says that Jesus views the household. And so he talks about how the slaves should be with the masters because in those days slaves lived with families within their homes. And a corollary could be of how um, people who work need to have what attitude to have to their employers. How they should, everyone should have, a, how they should view the institution of government and how the marriage, the husband-wife dynamic works. And, and you can see there is a particular order here he talks about, not just Peter, even Paul, that he writes, you will see it is very unique. The first person they talk about is the slaves and then the master, or the wives and then the husband. Because here, in those world, in, in that cultural climate, slaves and women were trashed and treated as a nobody. They were not important. They were not significant. In fact, they were not even worth talking about. So you could barely find anything written about those people. But here, in God's economy, those who are the last shall be first. Those who are the weak are the strong. So he gives a dignity to slaves by first writing about them and how God sees them. He gives a dignity to women, especially, as wives, how God sees them and what their special role in the family is. And though it's talking about wives, in this particular situation, it can be applied to any women in general, whether you're married or single. Because the root of the issues he is going to talk about here are not just something specifically related to what happens in the context of marriage. It's related to all men and all women of what they think they are and who they think they are and how they should live in this world. So I, whether you are young and single or older and single or married, this is something that God has for everyone. So I want to talk about three things today in this passage. The first is the identity of a thriving woman. The second is the character of a thriving woman, and the heart of a thriving woman. And third is the influence of a thriving woman. The identity, the heart, and influence. So let's read um, 
First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and, and focus on what God talks here about the identity of a thriving woman. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. You know, this word, submission, is one of the most abused words in the entire Bible. It's also one of the most misunderstood verses. You know, this is the worst angry, rude men or husbands throw at their wives to win over an argument or to have their way. Bible never ever. leaders, especially John Newton, who was a slave trader and the author of Abundi, uh, Amazing Grace, who inspired William Wilberforce to enact uh, the first law and worked towards abolishing slavery in human history. It was Bible-believing Christians who ended slavery and are pioneering and championing that even right now over the world through organizations like International Justice Mission. So first, Everyone's called to subject themselves to the government and subject to your employers. And third, it says everyone inside the church also ought to submit to one another, especially if you go to Ephesians 5, 
the verses that were read to us, if you read verse 18, it says, Submit yourselves to one another in the Lord. And then it says, Wives likewise to husbands. In that verse, the word submit is not even there in the verse where it's specifically addressed to wives. Because it says, Inside the church, everyone is expected to submit to one another, which means put someone above you, their needs above you, to serve them. So submission is not in ten, inherently a bad word. But here's the twist. Peter just doesn't say, wife, submit to your husbands. He uses a peculiar word. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And there is a reason. Why would Paul ask them to submit to their own husbands? Of course, the second part says, uh, some of them especially were not even Christians. And we need to dig a little deeper to unpack this. Because Paul, Peter's concern at this point is not life within the Christian community, but life at those points where the Christian community or marriage interfaced with the world around it. And that's the reason why in this passage you will see that he's not talking about children. Because the context was there were wives who had married to Christians was the first generation, and, and it, it wasn't like children had totally unbelieving parents or things like that. But what was re the reason for Peter talking about that is, as I said earlier, the Greco Roman society had certain prescriptions for what a wife or a woman should be like. You know, one of them, um, Plutarch, uh, he, he has this quote. It says of how the wife is ex expected to follow the husband's religion. A wife ought not to make friends of her own, but to enjoy her husband's friends in common with her. The gods are the first and most important friends. Wherefore, it is becoming for a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husbands believe in, and to shut the front door upon all queer rituals and outlandish superstitions. So the expectation is, if you are married to someone, you should worship the God your husband worships. Now what happens if the wife becomes a Christian? There is a lot of trouble. And that could disrupt the social fabric. If she starts worshipping a God who is not the God of her husband, it violated the Greco-Roman ordeal of an orderly home. Secondly, the husband and the society would perceive the wife's worship of Jesus Christ as rebellion. And so here is where Peter is doing something very ingenious. He's telling the wives, hey, God is calling you to live counterculturally. Though he is telling them to submit to their husbands, he is indirectly telling them, do not submit to a few things. You don't have to submit to your husband's God. You don't have to submit to the cultures, the larger culture's narrative of God or wives or how they should be. So there is a, a subliminal message that he is putting in that is going out to the people. He first says, submit by not submitting to these things which are not from God because God has called you to live a countercultural life. You don't have to conform to this Greco-Roman culture's worldview of what it says a wife should do or shouldn't do. You don't have to conform to the religion of your husband who believes in whatever philosophies or myths. God is now having a direct relationship with you. So you're free not to worship your husband's God. And that's huge. And you don't have to submit to him for that. And you're free not to follow what the suppressive Greco-Roman culture is defining you to be. You know what this means? 
it's, it's, it's so subversive and disruptive. It means it's not just for wives. It says even the same for slaves. It says that it means for the first time in your life and history, you both have a freedom and a moral responsibility that comes from that which you never had so far. An unprecedented thought in Greek worldview. You don't have to follow each of these. What is the meta narrative of the wider culture today? We are not living in a Greco Roman culture. We are living in a post enlightened, post modern, post Christian, post religion, post post culture which doesn't believe in any absolute truth. And there are two competing ideologies that keep trying to define womanhood. It's either the Wonder Woman mentality, on the one hand, or what I want to call as the victim mentality, on the other hand. And I've come across both these worldviews as I've counseled numerous women inside and outside the church over the past several years. You know, what is the hidden philosophy or psychology? Remember, Wonder Woman was created by a psychologist, not by some random movie art director. The, the, the presupposition or the foundation of a Wonder Woman mentality is absolute freedom. I'm absolutely free. Absolute independence. No one can tell me who I am or what I should do. I have the full power and freedom to decide how I want to live my life. That led to radical feminism that was birthed right here in California. And that's rooted in two things, absolute individualism and absolute autonomy. I need to do what I want to do, then I want to do. No one, including my husband, has a voice in that. Now that's one extreme. Then there's the other extreme, which is this victim mentality, where women are abused. They're in abusive relationships, where men brutally abuse them verbally, physically, and in so many other ways. And yet, they want to stay in that. And they want to do that, and I have asked many times women when they come to me and share that they are in an abusive relationship, I say, why don't you want to get out? And even after I provide them options of how to separate themselves from that relationship to try to work together, they will refuse because, oh, I'm concerned of what my family will think, what my wider culture will think. So they're willing to suppress themselves for the sake of society or family or more. It's, it's the opposite of individualism. It's what's called collectivism. They want to do what the larger culture wants them to do. And worse, women sometimes who get divorced from abusive women who have left them and gone tend to marry the same kind of abusive women and go back to those same relationships because of victim mentality. So here, the Bible is saying you don't have to do both. You're neither a wonder woman nor a victim woman. Both are not biblical. It says, so as a woman or a wife, your identity is not to be drawn from these popular cultural meta narratives, but it is to be drawn from the Bible. There is a design for marriage, and, and that design involves submission to your husbands, even to those who don't know God. And what does submission mean? It means you're willing to care for them, love them, and willing to let them lead, which is a godly thing. Submission is letting your husband lead, and you follow, even if some do not know the gospel is what it says. Because there is a goal that's bigger than that. And the goal is that they may be one without the word. You know, in general, um, psychologists call how the number of words that a man speaks and the number of words a woman speaks is so different. 
I don't have the numbers, but Sat here has the exact statistic on that. You can talk to him after church. I might be wrong. I think a man speaks on an average maybe a few hundred words per day, but I think a woman speaks close to 35,000 words a day or something like that. You know, we were at a marriage conference over this weekend, and um, there was one person who was saying, if someone asks, uh, if, if a conversation between a husband and a wife, the husband tells um, the wife, hey, you know, I saw someone yesterday when I was shopping, and the wife asks, who was that? And the husband will say, I saw John. And that's the end of the conversation. It's straight up forward. And he says, if it's the other way around, if the wife says, hey, you know whom I saw at the supermarket? And the husband says, who was that? And the, and the answer will not be a straight response. And she will start by saying, well, before I went to the supermarket, I went to the bank. And at the bank, this happened. And, and, and because that happened in the bank, I had to go here and there. And, and it becomes a lengthy conversation. And finally, after 20 minutes or so, she gives the answer of who it was, which is what the husband wanted. Have you ever had those experiences in your married lives? I mean, maybe that's a different culture than not here for you. And, and, and this seems to have been an issue because the women, when they, were, when they became Christians, they were eager for their husbands to become Christians. So what they did was pestering them and kept on telling them, become a Christian, become a Christian. You know, sometimes wives think you can change your husbands by the plurality of your words. Or if you say the same thing ten times, you think your husbands will change. It's not even something as big as the gospel. It can be something smaller. Because you think if you can fix and change your husband to be the kind of person you want to be, your life is going to be happily ever after. Peter says, sorry, it's not going to work. You can talk how much ever you want, but that's not where change is coming from. It says, without a word, without a word. And the word he uses is, let them see who you are. But then, he says, it's, how, how does this work? It's, you're called to submit to your husbands, and we read it read in Ephesians, just like uh, the church submits to Christ. Now, you can say for a church, it's easy to submit to Christ because Jesus was perfect, but you don't know my husband. He's not perfect. He's so imperfect. He has this quirkiness. He has all of these things. And that's why if you go to the previous verses where it talks about uh, the command to slaves, it, says, it gives a model. It says, slaves, submit to your husbands like Jesus did. Where it says when Jesus was called to submit he, he willingly submitted to his father, which was not easy. In order to submit to the heavenly father, it meant that he had to patiently endure being beaten and scorned and spit by sol soldiers. And when he was reviled, he reviled not, but continuously gave them over to God, who is a righteous model. You know, the imagery that he is bringing in for submission is not from the world, but from Christ himself. And he's telling the wives the same thing. And if you look at the Bible, throughout the Bible, if you read uh, the famous Psalm 128, verse 3, it says, your wife will be like a fruitful wine within your house. You know, the imagery that is used to describe a wife is that of a fruitful wine. You know, who else was described as a wine in the Bible? It's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the true wine. So here Peter is actually elevating the worth and significance of a woman and especially a wife. He says, you know, wives, your worth is like that of Christ himself. You, I want you to be like the true wine inside your house first. Because when that happens, it's going to spill outside. You know, very often I've, I've heard and seen this when women who are working outside, they can be so kind and polite and gentle to their peers and their bosses, even when they do things that they don't like. But when they come inside the house, they want to vent all the frustration of how bad their day was on their husbands. It's the exact opposite. 
But he says, I want you to be a fruitful vine like Jesus inside your house. Not easy. It's not easy for Jesus to submit. It involves you suppressing sometimes your desires, your selves, and the hurts you're receiving. You know why? You're not doing it for yourself when you do this. Because Christ did that, something is possible for you and me to become like Christ. When you do that, it will help your husband to have Christ formed in him. Which means in marriage, as a woman, you want to bring not the best out of your husband, you want to bring Christ out of your husband. Which is why you submit, even when it is hard, even when it is difficult, even when it seems impossible for you. Because your submission to your husband has a missional impetus, both inside and outside your home. So, I want to ask those who are married, do you love submitting to your husband as unto the Lord? If that's hard for you, maybe you have to step back and ask, which of these two narratives are defining me? Am I drawn towards the wonder women narrative that is preventing me from submitting? Or do I just blindly submit, including all the sinful behaviors my husband does and not disrupting the status quo because I want to be a good person? Your wives, you have a high calling. Your calling is to reflect Christ, like how Christ submitted. And how do you do that? Not just by hearing and listening to your husband, being like Christ. One of the Christ-like things you can do as a woman or as a wife is to do what Christ did. And you know what Christ did every morning? He spent time with his heavenly father on his knees in prayer. I didn't want to embarrass someone here uh, not to blow up anyone's trumpet. One of, you know, one of the things I've been personally encouraged in my own life is when I wake up every morning, the first image I see is my wife praying on her knees on the bed. That's the first thing I see. She prays for me. She prays for our family, she prays for our church, and other things, and she prays long and hard. She's the biggest inspiration of my prayer life. That's Christ-likeness. And those who are not married and are single, I have something for you. Find men whom you can gladly submit to. Someone who already has Christ in him. Seek such men. I, I give it to you. It's hard to find those men these days, isn't it? But don't fall into the trap of thinking, let me find some guy who we share similar hobbies and similar thoughts, and he's a good guy, he has good character, and then I try to make him a Christian, and then my life will be great. I'm sorry, it won't. Because that's not in your hands. And because of this, many young women tend to compromise and go through so much pain later on in their lives. So to be ordered to do this, you need to find, be rested in your identity. You know, the identity of a thriving woman where, is one where you ought to pursue neither being free nor a slave, but like Christ. That's your identity. When you see yourselves like that, It'll be easy to submit to your husbands. But for you, for that, you need Christ in your hearts. And you love him more than your husband or other things. And that's where it begins. So I want you to think about where is your identity that's driving your behavior. Let's move to the second point, the heart of a thriving woman. Verse 3 and 4, it says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So here's an important question that's asked. There's a question that's underneath. 
What makes a woman beautiful? Is it the braiding of hair, putting on gold jewelry, clothing you wear? Again, I might get into serious trouble today. I'm using a lot of my own illustrations. I have three three girls in my house. So when I walk into the restroom, there's there's this sink on the restroom. So on my, my side, I have like maybe three or four things. You know, a toothbrush, a paste, a comb, and a couple of shaving gear. It fits into a small you know, tray, like the size of this. And then there's this side. It has three shelves. And there are things in that shelf, I have no idea what they do. I don't know if how your house is, so I'm just using a very tiny corner. That's a man's life these days. It's just exponentially growing every day, and there are ads everywhere you see. And now it's gone and taken a step further, you know, how it has to be environmentally friendly and and, and social just socially justly sourced from the right sources, and which means you just pay five times more for the same thing. And you know, the average time a woman spends on her hair and gold and clothing, one of the common things I've heard from husbands why they are late to church is because it takes time for their wives to get ready. Why? Why is that? Why? Why, why, why does this happen? This was apparently very common in the Greco Roman culture, too. First of all, because he's saying, you know, braiding your hair, putting on gold jewelry and clothing, these, some of these women were very rich. You know, they could afford gold jewelry and, and all these pricey and costly things. And even the Greco Roman culture did not appreciate women who were going around like that, and that's always in Peter's mind. He says, don't do anything that this outside world is going to equate you into someone who is not attractive that they want to follow. But why is it that the world tries to sell this and, and we go for it? Could it be, perhaps, to mask some hidden struggles in the heart that comes from our heart? You know, why do women want to have all of these things? There's only one possible reason. Most of the times, I'm not here to judge anyone's heart, but it is for you. The reason why emphasis is placed on dressing more or dressing less, or putting on more or putting on less, has nothing to do with what is more or less, or which dress is more appropriate or modest, or which is not. He's not even going into an argument there. The, the objective, the reason he's challenging, why do you want to do that, is perhaps you want to be seen, you want to be modest. And that gives you some kind of a satisfaction. That's why the women in Greco Roman culture were going, because when they walked the street with their flamboyant jewelry and exotic dresses, they attracted, drew attention, and they felt great about themselves. You know, if I dress this way, either with less or more, 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 I get more looks, and that makes me feel more valued or more important or more good. And when I post that picture on my Instagram story, it's going to get more number of likes, and I'm going to feel better about myself. And, and it's not that less is bad or more is bad. Less is more sometimes. Because I like to be seen. You know what that means? It means you're not happy with who you are. There's something that is bothering you. You have believed in something about your identity that we spoke about in the first place. You know, your, your worth does not come from the attention you get by dressing up or dressing down. Don't give that power to others. I don't think I am beautiful, and so I want to cover that by all these things. You know, growing up in India, I don't know if they still have it, there was this uh, cream that was 
advertised called Fair and Lovely. I think they had a lawsuit after that because they used bleach. For, it's a very harmful chemical for the skin. Because somehow behind the Fair and Lovely, was it, it, the ads would be obnoxious if you watch them. The idea was if you're dark, you're dirty. You're not ugly. You're, you're ugly. So brighten up your skin. Only if you're white or fair, you're beautiful. And I know some of my boy, uh, guy friends in college would also put that. Because they also wanted to be white. They thought, oh, I am dark. I am black. Nobody will like me. Peter is saying, don't do that. You are, you are enough in Christ. Whether you're white or black. Of brown, you're beautiful. Jesus loves you. You're his precious daughter. You don't need validation from anyone or anybody in this world. So don't go after it. Be yourself. He's not against dressing up. He says, let it not be merely all these things. Go for it. Do it if you want to. If you want to, you know, celebrate who you are by how God has really. Design you, go for it. But there is a very thin line sometimes. You know, I've even heard dressing up to church. There's a thin line between dressing up to present yourself uh, honorable and out of respect to God, and dressing up for all these other things which only you do in your head. But Peter is saying you're enough in Christ, and so he says. But don't do that. But he says, verse four. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. You know, he uses the word precious. He says, the, the gold jewelry and the exotic dresses, which the world says are precious because you pay more, that's not really precious. You know what's really precious for you as a woman? What is precious? In God's sight, and again, he's drawing attention to the word without words, but seeing, you know, you know what, who, what matters? It's, it doesn't matter how the world sees you. You need to be concerned about how and what God sees in you. He says, this is precious. You know what God sees? As he says, you know, which is in God's sight is precious, as verse 4 says. The hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. When God sees in my heart, he desires to see gentleness and a quiet spirit. If you don't have that, even if you put all these exotic things on you, you're not going to be precious in God's sight. If you're a quarrelsome wife, if you're a fighter, if you're someone who doesn't believe in this and, and is always trying to stand up for your life, sadly, that's not precious or beautiful in God's life. Even if you look beautiful, if you have all the most beautiful dresses in the world, what is quiet? What is gentle and a quiet spirit? You know, the Greek word that is used for gentle is the word paros, um, which is the word that actually comes also in the Beatitudes, where Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. This meekness just doesn't come by default. Before that, he says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. You need to have realized you're broken, sinful, and you're, there's nothing, you're not better than anybody else. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and blessed are those who are mourned. You have mourned for your sinfulness and repented, and that's now made you into a meek person. Meekness, the word prowess, refers to uh, the power of a wild horse that is restricted. You know, wild horses, before they are broken, they run wild. But, but when cowboys go and train those horses, now their power can be harnessed towards something powerful and constructive. It's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. God is not saying, I want you to be meek by becoming weak. In fact, meekness is strength. Submission isn't weakness. It's strength in action. Even the Wonder Woman, 
demonstrates when she supports her team and she fights for what's good, sometimes she trusts others and steps back and takes the lead for them to take the lead. The biblical submission means trusting in God's order and using their strength to build up their husbands and creating a partnership that reflects God's love and harmony. Meekness is strength in action. Women, you are incredibly powerful. You can make it or break it for your husband. You can make them into the kind of men and women, men, the kind of man that God wants to use to be a change maker in the world, or you can deflate him or a, a last ounce of self-respect and self-worth he has and make him sit crouched towards the corner of a home as a defeated man. Don't do that. You're more powerful. Meekness is weakness and strength. That's the real beauty, the Bible says. In Proverbs 31, verse 30, it says, Charm is deceitful, deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And you know what? Jesus was a gentle person. He rode gently onto a throne into Jerusalem as a king, and only when he reigns in your heart as a king will you be able to do this. These are the two things that Peter is talking to them about their dress and their heart. And, and, and in order for them to be able to do it, the ultimate model is Christ himself. Because when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he wasn't wearing the flamboyant, exotic dress and a golden crown. He did not have a crown of gold, but he had a crown of thorns. He did not, not only did he not have expensive clothes, he had no clothes at all. He was completely naked, taking the shame that you are sometimes feeling about you on himself on the cross so you can be free. You don't need those things to give you that sense of self-worth. And this Jesus, when he comes into your heart, he comes gently. He doesn't force himself. He comes gently as a king, and when he becomes that king, you will have the power to be a truly meek person. And that makes you precious in God's sight. And that's why he uses the word seize more often. And what, as a woman of God, you need to worry about is how Christ sees me, not how others see me. And lastly, the influence of a thriving woman was five and six. So this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him love. And you are our children. If you do good, you do not fear anything that is frightening. And here he talks about the powerful illustration of women in the Old Testament. He says, God, how the holy women hope in and specifically goes and talks about Sarah. And what was it that was great about Sarah? It says how they submitted to their own husbands. How did Sarah submit to Abraham? You know, Sarah submitted to Abraham by following Abraham wherever he went. Because she knew that God was leading her husband, that God had made a covenant with her husband Abraham, and he was about to do something amazing, even when it was hard for her to believe. Abraham moved God, moved because of the covenant that God established with him, where he told him to go, and he left his land. Go to the land which I am about to give, and I will make you father of many nations. And so he moved, and therefore she went wherever he left. Because together now, they were helping realize and accomplish God's covenant. That is what submission is. Following your husband, not blindly into anything, to fulfill God's plan for your life and his, and his big purpose. So ask your husbands if they, if they ask you, you. You should sometimes challenge and question and discuss and dialogue. Hey, is this from God or is this from you? I don't want to get into trouble. Don't use that on everything and then blame it on me. Same thing with Rebecca and Rachel. 
But there is also another counter example not here, and that was the example of Lot, Lot's wife. And what did she do? When she followed, what did she do? She stopped and turned back and became a pillar. She couldn't go to the promised land. She couldn't have the joy of, of, of being such a godly family used by God to do amazing things. In fact, the only time Sarah actually calls Abraham Lord is when she is told that she will bear a child when she is super old and she's laughing and saying, how can I bear a child with my Lord? And even in that sad moment, she addresses him respectfully. It's a very sad moment as a couple. They're fighting to have a child and they're not able to have a child. She has, she has every reason to feel angry, but she still calls Abraham as Lord out of respect. And she influences her children's wives, Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. And women, you are going to influence your children. Your children are watching you. And if you reflect Christ, they are going to reflect Christ in their homes. And you will have an impact in generations for being this Christ-like person in their home. And he, he leaves them with this verse, which is, Important, if you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. You know, submission is not suppressing your personality and doing everything that is harmful to you. You don't have to fear. You don't have to live in abusive environments. You are free. But if you are reflecting Christ, he says in other places, older women, teach the younger women. Are you influencing? Who are you influencing? Starting in your home. Look at your children. If you have girls in your home, ask yourself, will I be happy if my daughter turns out to be just like me because the odds are they will. And your grandkids and their grandkids. It, it's just an exponential decline in three, four generations. It will only get worse. What are they learning in your home? Start by being an influencer. It's a great word these days, isn't it, in social media. Everyone wants to be an influencer. They spend so much time and energy in crafting that perfect shot and perfect video and even the perfect captions. I hear you just not enough to post something on Instagram. You're on the perfect caption and there are websites to write captions for you that will make you an influencer. No. Jesus said you don't need any words. Be an influencer quietly by being this kind of woman that displays gentleness of Christ. You don't need anything to adorn yourself and, and pass it on. And, and, and influence younger women. Are you influencing anybody else outside your home? Find someone to mentor and be. Let's pray.